So verse number 17, we left off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ حِينَ تُنْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُسْبِحُونَ So glory be to God when you enter upon the eve, evening and when you rise at morning. This verse seems to be a conclusion of the previous verses that we covered where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in verse number 11, Allah يَبْدَأُ الْخَلْقِ ثُمَّ يُعِيدُ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ That God originates creation, then brings it back, then on to Him, you shall be returned. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the creation of, of man. He spoke about the day of judgment, how He will resurrect and bring all people. He will gather them all for reckoning. And then He spoke about the destiny of the believers and the non-believers, and how the Day of Judgment is a day of, of separation. Here, because of that, because Allah is the originator, and He will bring everything back to life for reckoning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ حِينَ تُمْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ In the previous verses, in verse number 15, there was a mentioning of the believers. As for the believers who do righteous deeds, who believe and do righteous deeds, for them will be a, uh, they will be made joyous in the garden. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives more detail on how someone, what someone needs to do to reach those par those paradisal gardens. So glory be to God when you enter upon the eve tumsun wahina tusbihun and when you enter the morning period. And then if we if we go to verse number eighteen, these two verses should be read together. His is the praise in the heavens and on the earth when the sun declines and when you reach noontide. Now, when you look at these two verses, there are really two ways to understand these verses. They can be understood as a declarative statement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially saying that he is praised and glorified at all times. Meaning, you know, it's it's basically a, a reiteration of what, what Imam Zain al-Abidin states in his munajat, munajat of Zakarin, Anta al-musabbahu fi kulli makan wal ma'budu fi kulli zaman. Oh Allah, you are the one who is glorified at every, you are the one who is glorified in every place, and you are the one who is worshipped in every time. So these four times, there are four time periods that are mentioned in verses 17 and 18. حِينَ تُمْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ تُصْبِحُونَ is number two. Ashiyan in verse number 18. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعَشِيًا So this وَعَشِيًا goes back to the, the, uh, the tasbih. وَحِينَ تُظْهِرُونَ So there are four time periods that are mentioned. Some scholars say that these four time periods represent all of the times of the day. The, the morning, the afternoon, late afternoon, and the the night. So some have said that these four time periods metaphorically refer to all times. People usually use these expressions to signify a certain part of the day. And when you bring them all together, they essentially refer to all periods of the day. So the idea is that Allah Azza wa Jal 
is glorified and praised at every moment. Everything does tasbih. Everything is engaged in his praise. A second way of understanding this verse is to say that the verse is actually an injunction, meaning that we are being commanded to glorify, to magnify Allah Azza wa Jal during these times. Now the first thing that comes to mind is the only obligation that we have to remember God on a daily basis is in the form of the daily prayers. But when you look at the verse, there are four time periods that are mentioned. And we know that the daily prayers are five in number. So how do we reconcile this, uh, this contradiction? The scholars have said, the ulama of tafsir, they have said that these time periods are a reference to the daily prayers. That when Allah says, فَسُبْحَانَ حِينَ تُنْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَحَشِيًّا وَحِينَ تُظْهِرُونَ It's a reference to the five daily prayers, even though four times are mentioned. They say because حِينَ تُمْسُونَ when you enter the evening, when you enter the night, this includes Maghrib and Isha, because the time period between Maghrib and Isha is very, very minimal. It's a very short time period, relatively short. Wahina Tusbihun at the end of ayah number 17 refers to Salat al Fajr. And then in verse number 18, وَعَشِيًّا عَشِيًّا is the, the late afternoon, which is a reference to Salat al-Asr. And then at the end of the ayah, end of verse number 18, وَحِينَ تُظْهِرُونَ is a reference to Salat al -Dhuhr. So four times are mentioned, but in, in, in حِينَ تُمْسُونَ it actually includes Salat al-Maghrib and Salat al-Isha. Now the question that arises when we speak about the five daily prayers is, why, do, why is it five in number? Is this, is this an arbitrary uh, divine commandment or is there actually, is there wisdom behind why it is five? There's a, a narration that I'd like to share with you from Wasail al-Shia. And it's, it's a very beautiful tradition where, where Zayd ibn Ali, Zayd, the son of Ali, so Zayd, the brother of Imam al-Baqir, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abidin. So Zaydi Muslims are named after this, this uh, son of Imam al-Sajjad. He says, he has a conversation with his father about the Isra and Mi'raj and, and specifically about the establishment of the five daily prayers. He says, سَأَلْتُ أَبِي سَيِّدَ الْعَابِدِينَ He says, I asked my father the ornament of worshippers. He, he's speaking about his father, Imam Ali ibn Hussain. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَا Zayd ibn Ali says, I asked my father, O oh my father, أَخْبِرْنِي Tell me about أَخْبِرْنِي عَنْ جَدِّنَا رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَمَّا عُرِجَ بِهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَأَمَرَهُ رَبُّهُ بِخَمْسِينَ صَلَاةِ He asked his father, tell me about our grandfather when he ascended to heaven and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to establish 50 prayers. Many of us are familiar with this story where during the Mi'raj, 
the five, the daily prayers were legislated. And they were initially 50. Initially, there were 50 daily prayers that were legislated. When the Prophet ﷺ descended from those higher worlds, he, he meets Musa. And it was Musa who basically intervened and interceded and told the Prophet that your Ummah cannot, they don't have the capacity to perform 50 prayers per day. So Ali ibn Zayd, so Zayd ibn Ali is asking Imam Zayd ibn Abidin that why is it that the Prophet didn't ask Allah to reduce the number? Is it that Musa alayhi salam, you know, has more knowledge and he has more wisdom than the Prophet? So why is it that it that the Prophet didn't suggest that the number be reduced? Because it gives you the impression that you know Musa is much more practical, he's much more wise. And so how do we how do we explain this? Imam Zayn al Abidin he gives a very beautiful answer. And believe me, this type of answer can only come from Ahlul Bayt. He faqan ya bunay. Imam al Sajjad he says, Oh my son, Inna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala la yaktarih ala radde wa la yurajhu fi shayin ya murudi. Oh my son, know that the Messenger of God, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, he does not make suggestions to his Lord. The Prophet is a perfect slave of God. Whatever Allah commands him, he accepts it. The Prophet doesn't negotiate with Allah. So this is where you see the perfection of his ubudiyya. فَلَمَّا سَأَلَهُ مُوسَى صَارَ وَصَارَ شَفِيعًا لِأُمَّتِهِ إِلَيْهِ لِأُمَّتِهِ إِلَيْهِ لَمْ يَجُزْ لَهُ رَدُّ شَفَاعَةِ أَخِيهِ مُوسَى When Musa السلام, made that request, Musa was acting as an intercessor for us. He was asking the Prophet for a favor, to intercede on our behalf. So Musa was interceding for us. Imam Zain al Abidin he says it would not be befitting for the Prophet to decline the request of his brother Musa. So there are two elements here. When Allah initially commanded the Prophet that his that there should there should be fifty daily prayers, the Prophet doesn't object. He doesn't object because he is a humble slave of God. But when Musa السلام, intercedes for us, the Prophet is also what? The Prophet is the perfect Abd, but he's also Rahmatan lil Alameen. He's also the epitome of, of good manners. So because of Musa, السلام, because the Prophet is never declines a favor or request that is made of him, he he goes back. The hadith says, ila The Prophet ﷺ returns to that station. ila rabbihi ila an raddaha ila salawat. The Prophet asked for it to be reduced until it was eventually reduced to five. Five daily prayers. So the hadith says, so Zayd ibn Ali then asks, قَالَ فَقُلْتُ لَهُ يَا أَبَتِي فَلِمَ لَمْ يَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَلَمْ يَسْأَلْهُ التَّخْفِيفِ مِنْ خَمْسِ صَلَوَاتُ وَقَدْ سَأَلَهُ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ يَرْجِعْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَيَسْأَلْهُ التَّخْفِيفِ the narration says that the Prophet went and it was reduced to 40. And then Musa said 40 is still too much. And, to, and then the Prophet goes back and it was reduced to 30, to 20, to 10. Eventually it was reduced to 5. 
Zayd ibn Ali is asking Imam Zayn al-Abideen, why did the Prophet stop at five? Because Musa asked the Prophet that even five is too much. Ask your Lord to reduce it even further, make it even less than five. But the Prophet declined. So Rasulullah accepted the intercession of Musa to reduce it from 50 all the way to five. But at five, the Prophet said, this is enough. Zayd bin Ali is asking, why didn't the Prophet continue to ask for the five daily prayers to be reduced? Imam Zayn al-Abidin, he says, Ya Bunay, أَرَادَ أَنْ يُحَصِّلَ لِأُمَّتِهِ التَّخْفِيفِ مَعَ أَجْرِ خَمْسِينَ صَلَاةِ He said, O oh my son, it's because the Prophet wanted to reduce, he wanted to lighten the burden on his Ummah and still allow them to get the reward of performing 50 prayers. Now how is that? Because in the Quran we have an ayah that says, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا Whoever brings a good deed, it will be multiplied by 10. So five daily prayers, if you multiply it by 10, it has the reward of what? Of 50. So you see the Prophet Sallallahu he, he accepts the intercession of Musa, he reduces it from 5 to 50, from 50 to 5, and he, he doesn't reduce it below 5, so we don't miss on the thawab of 50 prayers. It's a beautiful hadith, and, and there's also another uh, subtlety in the hadith, and this is a narration that also highlights the idea that the dead are able to benefit the living. Right? You know, this narration is also mentioned in Sunni traditions, the, the idea that it was Musa who intervened and reduced the prayers from 50 to 5. So we ask those who don't believe in tawassul, who don't believe that the dead can benefit the living, we say to them, didn't Musa, who is deceased, benefit the Ummah of the Prophet? So this is an example of how the living can draw benefit from the deceased. فَسُبْحَانَ حِينَ تُمْسُونَ وَحِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ So glory be to God when you enter upon the evening and when you, when you rise up at, at morning. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعَشِيًّا وَحِينَ تُظْهِرُونَ His is the praise in the heavens. And on the earth, when the sun declines, and when you reach noontide. So these, according to many scholars, is the injunction of the five daily prayers. Now, just a, a quick comment on the difference between tasbih and tahmid. What is the difference between subhanallah and alhamdulillah? It's, it's an integral part of our worship. The declaring Allah's glory and declaring His praise. Tasbih and Tahmeed. Saying Alhamdulillah and saying Subhanallah. Subhanallah, of course, it has a very broad meaning, but just to put it very simply, Subhanallah is, a, is an expression of Tanzih. Tanzih is negating all imperfection and limitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So subhanallah is expressing what God is not. It's, an, it's, an, it's a negational expression. That he has no body, he's not confined by space or time, he doesn't have a spouse, he doesn't have a son, he doesn't need sustenance, he doesn't need a partner. That he is beyond anything that we can fathom. Subhanallah is to negate all imperfection and deficiency and limitation from his essence. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدِ And hamd is... So if tasbih is negating 
imperfection and deficiency from him. Hamd is attributing perfection to him. Attributing all of those qualities of perfection and you know the 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 attributes of uh, of Jamal. وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعَشِيًّا وَحِينَ تُبْهِرُونَ Verse number 19 يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَيُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا وَكَذَلِكَ تُخْرَجُونَ He brings forth the living from the dead and brings forth the dead from the living and he revives the earth after its death and in this way you shall be brought forth now this verse again goes back to this idea of of resurrection you know brothers and sisters the signs of Qiyama are all around us. We witness it, especially during certain times of the year. You know, in the springtime, we witness with our own eyes this phenomenon of وَيُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ that he brings forth the living from the dead. Trees die, plants die, flowers wither away, and suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings forth the living from the dead. If we go back, even if we go back to the human being, now, of course, you and I, we come from one living cell. You and I, our origin was a drop of sperm, one cell. Now, someone may say that it's a living thing, so it's not, it can be referring to to us on, on the individual level. But we know for certain that Adam السلام, was not created through a drop of, uh, of sperm. He doesn't have any forefathers. He doesn't have any parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah, surah Tasajda, Surah 32, verse 7, Allah says, وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينَ That He began the creation of man from mud. You know, brothers and sisters, this is one of the most, one of the most puzzling aspects of nature. One of the mysteries of life, and, and this is something that even scientists today have not fully understood. They still don't understand the origin of life. Where did life come from? There was a point where there was absolutely no life forms on earth. And then suddenly you see the flourishing of life in the form of cells, multicellular organisms. And then you have sophisticated biological organisms. They have no explanation for this. How is it that something living comes from something inanimate? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, that the first human being rose from the inanimate. Clean mud doesn't contain life. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashioned the human being when, when the when the Bible, when the uh, when the uh, the elements of the earth come together in a way, and this is something that's studied in, in biochemistry, biochemical reactions take place, and you have life under certain conditions. But why does this take place? How does this how does this transpire? It's one of the mysteries that there that there has to be a living force that is guiding this. So, one of the mysteries of science is the origin of life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the one who brought, who brings the, the living from the dead, initially, 
because there was uh, there was a time when there was no life. The one who brings the living from the dead is able to bring to restore life to the dead. وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ God, so he brings forth, he brings forth the living from the dead, and brings forth the dead from the living, meaning he causes them to die, and he revives the earth after its death. وَيُحْيِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا Now before we speak about this part of the ayah, وَيُحْيِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا there are some traditions that speak about the, the symbolic nature of this verse. So one ta'weed, one interpretation of this verse that we find in Tafsir al-Qummi, for example, is that the living and, and the dead can be extended to include the spiritually living and the spiritually dead. So Ali ibn Ibrahim, who was a contemporary of Imam al-Askari, al he says the ta'wil of this ayah is يُخْرِجُ الْمُؤْمِنْ مِنَ الْكَافِرِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْكَافِرَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنْ Then Allah, in the same way that He brings the living from the dead, and the dead from the living, Allah also brings the believer from the disbeliever and the disbeliever from the believer. Meaning that we have many examples of children who come from dis uh, believing children, pious people who came from corrupt parents and vice versa. So for example, you know, bringing وَيُخْرِجُ الْمُؤْمِنْ مِنَ الْكَافِرِ You know, bringing a mu'min from a kafir or bringing a believer from a wicked person, we have many examples of this. Mutawakkil was an enemy of Ahlul Bayt. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that the son of Mutawakkil is Shia? He's one of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. So, this is an example of Allah bringing a believer forth from a disbeliever, someone who's, who's practically a disbeliever. Khalid ibn al-Walid, one of the individuals who attacked Lady Fatima alayhi salam. His son, Muhajir, was one of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, so you have Abu Bakr, and then you have Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was one of the, the devout servants of Imam Amir al -Mumin. Another example is we see Kashajim. Kashajim was the grandson of the killer of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. As Siddi ibn Shahik, he literally he was the one who killed the Imam. He killed Imam al kadhim alayhi salam when he was in prison. His grandson was a lover of Ahlul Bayt. So you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who your parents are, do not dictate who you become necessarily. There are believers who have come from the loins of disbelievers, and there are disbelievers who have come from the loins of believers. Nuh, his son, was a disbeliever. Adam's son. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that he can, he can, he can raise a believer who comes from a disbeliever and vice versa. يُخْرِجُ الْمُؤْمِنِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْكَافِرِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِ Now if we look at the end of the verse, وَيُحْيِ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا And he revives the earth after its death. Now of course the apparent meaning of this verse is very evident. That vegetation dies during certain seasons of the year and then it blooms in the spring. So we see the cycle of life and death. You know, one of the one of the names of Allah that is very evident year after year is are two of his names, especially two names. Al Muhi wal Mumit. 
the giver of life and the causer of death. So this cycle of life and death is a powerful manifestation of Allah's name, Al-Muhi wa al the, 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 the giver of life, the reviver, and the one who causes death. وَيُحْيَ الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا and he revives the earth after his death. There is a tradition from Imam Al-Kadhim salam, our seventh Imam, where he, he speaks about the ta'weel. You know, tafsir is what we can understand by looking at the words and their arrangement, by looking at the meanings of the words. But ta'weel is, is something that requires a connection with the divine. It's the hidden meaning. Ta'weel is something that you and I, we don't have the tools, we don't have the resources for it. It requires knowledge of the unseen, it requires access to that prophetic knowledge. So you and I, you know, a person can go to Hawza and become a Mufassir of the Qur'an. They can do Tafsir. But you, you can never do Ta'weel of the Qur'an. Ta'weel of the Qur'an is only, it's only the domain of those who are the authorized teachers of the Qur'an. The Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt. Imam al kazim alayhi salam, he shares the ta'wil of the last part of the ayah. That he will, he revives the earth after it has died. Imam al kazim alayhi salam, he says, لَيْسَ يُحْيِيهَا بِالْقَطْرِ وَلَكِنْ يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ رِجَالًا Imam al kazim he says, the reviving of the earth is not through raindrops. It is through people who Allah appoints, who God sends who revive justice and through justice the earth is revived and reviving justice on earth is more beneficial to the earth and to the inhabitants of the earth than 40 consecutive days of rain you know when it rains Animals drink, vegetation flourishes, our food supply, you know, when there's a drought, it affects us because our food supply is affected. We need rain. But Imam al-Kazim he says what's more important, what, what will really revive the earth, even more so than the rain, is the establishment of justice. So Imam al-Kazim salam looking at the ta'weed, the hidden meaning of this verse, he says, and he revives the earth after it has died. Because nothing causes the death and the destruction of the earth and its inhabitants more than oppression and zulm. So the ta'weed of this section of the ayah is a reference to the 12th Imam, that through, through establishing justice, the earth will be revived. Verse number 20. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ بَشَرٌ تَنْتَشِرُونَ Among his signs is that he created you from dust. Then behold, you are human beings ranging far and wide. This verse begins a series of verses where the verses begin with the phrase وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ So verse 20 to 25, they all revolve around God's signs and from among His signs, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ So verses 20 to 25 begin with this phrase, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ and خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تراب. Among his signs is that he created you from dust. 
that he created you from dust. You know, we human beings, with all of our intelligence, with all of our technology, we cannot create a human being from dust. We can facilitate the development of a human being through artificial insemination. We can, we can allow a human being to develop from a sperm into a fully grown fetus, but we need that first cell. There is no scientist in the world, no matter how brilliant you are, you need something to start with. You need that first cell. You need that DNA. One of his signs is that he created you from dust. Turan. There was a point, as I mentioned, where there was no life. That Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who, from this, from this inanimate material, from the earth, from the dirt, which is lifeless, he created a living, breathing organism with intelligence, with conscience. Isn't this something that should give us pause? The most brilliant scientists in the world, they cannot create a single mosquito. Wallah, they can't. They can't do it. Look at what's happening to the world because of a small little virus. We're powerless. Isn't it time that we admit that there is a higher power? That there is a there is a, a force that is controlling and governing this universe. There is a supreme intelligence. Among his signs is that he created you from dust. Now, not only did Allah create this magnificent creation from the inanimate, that would have been an achievement. But he also gave this human being the capacity to procreate you know it's one thing to design something but to design something that can self-replicate this is something that's astonishing that Allah created man and then he, he programmed the human being to procreate to create copies of yourself And, and talk about, you know, you know, when we create something, you know, you know, those who design cell phones, companies that manufacture cell phones, every year they have to update it because it becomes outdated. It becomes outdated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being and the human being can procreate and we adapt to our environment. Is there any technology, any cell phone that can adapt to changing circumstance, circumstances? No, it needs to be remade. Allah created Adam, He created Eve, Hawa. And then from these two, look at how quickly human beings have multiplied. We now inhabit every corner of the globe. How we've spread far and wide. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this ability to travel, to move about, to procreate. So this is one of the signs of Allah's power. It's a sign of His oneness. So, on one, also on, on another level, being created from dust is a reminder of our humble beginnings. It's a reminder of our humble origin. This is also a sign for us. It's a lesson for us. That we shouldn't be arrogant. We shouldn't boast. We need to remember where we came from. Every day, we put our feet on this earth. We step on the same earth that we were created from. 
So we shouldn't be we shouldn't be arrogant. We should have this humility in our hearts. And then in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us this mechanism of procreation. So we, we don't just regenerate as individuals. There's a system that Allah has created for us to guarantee the survival of our species. You know, there are some living organisms, they, they're able to regenerate without without any relations with another uh, with another uh, creature. They self-generate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us in this world. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So this ayah, is the verse that everybody puts on their wedding invitations. And among his signs is that he created mates for you from among yourselves, that you might find rest in them. And he established affection and mercy between you. Truly in that are signs for a people who reflect. Now what's interesting about this verse, there, there are many fascinating things about this verse. You know, typically when people think about marriage, we often associate marriage with starting a family. That we, we, we assume that marriage is simply a means to procreation. And of course, there's no denying that that's one of the purposes of marriage. But from this ayah, we understand that even if someone cannot have children, you can't have children. Does that mean that your marriage is useless? That there's no, there's no purpose? So marriage, according to this ayah, is not only a means. It's an end in and of itself. There's a benefit in and of itself, irrespective of whether someone has children or not. What is the purpose of, of marriage? Why did Allah create the system? Why did He create mates for us? This institution of marriage. Allah answers it very clearly. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So you can find requests. Sukun is that, that type of tranquility, and that, that peace. You know, we, we're social creatures. It's actually a torture method to put someone by themselves. You know, if, if, you, if they put you in solitary confinement for two, three weeks, you will lose your mind. You'll lose your mind. We are social creatures. When Allah says, and from among His signs is this institution of marriage. Now, there are a couple of things I want to share with you about about marriage that that we don't usually uh, highlight, and I think it's important. Now, Allah says it's a sign. Now, of course, a sign by definition is something that suggests the presence or existence of something else. So, signs point you to other things. There's something else that Allah wants us to understand. Now. Everything in creation, whether it is a rock, a plant, a star, an animal, everything manifests the attributes of God in accordance with its own capacity. So everything is an ayah, is a sign of God. What makes human beings special and unique is that we have a greater capacity to reflect divine attributes. Now, so how does this how does this uh, fall into our discussion? How, how does this relate to our discussion on marriage? There are certain attributes of Allah 
that men have more of a capacity to manifest than women, generally speaking. So for example, one of the names of Allah is Al-Qawi, the powerful, the one who has strength. Men, physically speaking, on average, they have more physical strength than women. So they have more of a capacity to display and reflect that, that name of God, that attribute. Al-Raziq, Allah is the sustainer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given more ability to the man to provide, right? You know, when a woman gets pregnant, for example, she loses her, you know, if she's, if she provides for the family, that's why, you know, there's maternity leave, right? They're not able to work with the same capacity, at the same uh, intensity. So this is why Islam has given the responsibility of financial maintenance on, on the man. So there are certain divine attributes that are more easily manifested by men. There are so the, but the, now these qualities are also manifested in women, but to a lesser degree. There are certain attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that that women have more of a capacity to manifest than men. Now men also can reflect these attributes, but. Generally, if we just go according to the fitra, it's it's a, it's at a lesser level. So, for example, Allah's quality of of rububiyyah, that He's the cherisher. You know, women are are, are better nurturers. Women are much more, they're, generally they're much more nurturing than men. So they have so this divine attribute is much more pronounced in them. Beauty. One of the attributes of Allah is beauty. Jamal. So they they reflect this attribute more intensely than than men. Rahma, mercy. Women tend to be much more compassionate than men. They have they have a softer they have softer hearts. So you see, marriage. What's unique about marriage is that it facilitates. The manifestation of those divine attributes. If you follow the Sharia, if men fulfill their responsibilities, as as uh, as articulated by our our religious tradition, they will manifest those divine qualities that are that are closer to their fitrah. And the same goes for women. So, for example. Islam says that a man has to provide for his family. So because he's playing that role, he becomes a manifestation of Allah's attribute, al-razaq or al-raziq. It's recommended, for example, for the wife to beautify herself in the presence of her husband. It's an important part of marriage. So she becomes a manifestation of that, that jamal. When, when a woman becomes pregnant, she has a child, she's, she's nurturing another human being. This is a manifestation of this, this uh, the divine attribute of rububiyyah, that he's the, the sustainer, the cherisher. So, when these two individuals come together in marriage, they are exposed to those attributes in their partner that are less pronounced in them. So you get a more complete picture. So there's this, this, this fusion that takes place, that the man is able to witness the attributes of Jamal and Rububiya and his, his wife. The wife is able to experience the divine attributes of Ar-Razi and al qawi through her husband. So when these come together, there is this beautiful equilibrium that is established. There is this sukun. Now, so Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mates for you. So you can experience the full spectrum of those divine attributes, because there are there are qualities 
that men have inherently, but there are other qualities that are that are lacking in us, that are deficient in us, and we make up for those qualities through our spouses. We're very complementary. It's a very complementary relationship. لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he established affection and mercy between you. Now, when you read this verse, what does it mean when Allah says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً You know, جَعَل in the, in the Arabic language, in the Quran, there are two types of جَعَل. See, when you read the translation, you don't, you don't pick up on these subtleties. He established. He established affection and mercy. How about all of those couples who don't have affection and mercy? There are many people who get married. There's no mawadda and there's no rahma. There's only hatred and violence and there's no, there's no... So why does Allah say He established affection and mercy when we see that there are many marriages, there's no affection and mercy? What does it mean when Allah says, وَجَعَلَ This is جَعَلَ What does it mean? There are two types of جَعَل in the Qur'an. There is جَعَل تَكْوِينِ and there's جَعَل تَشْرِيعِ There's a creational establishing of something. And there is a legislative establishing. So for example, when Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشَ we establish the day as a means of livelihood. No one can change that. That ja'al is unchangeable because that's a creational establishing. Whereas when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks about establishing laws, those laws can either be followed or abandoned. So it seems that this jahan that Allah is speaking of, it's a legislative jahan, meaning that He established affection and, and mercy between you. It means that He established commandments, laws, that if you follow them, there will be affection and mercy between you. If a husband fulfills the obligations that the Sharia has placed on him, and the wife fulfills her obligations that the Sharia has placed on her, there will be this mawadda and rahma. And you see that mawadda is mentioned and then rahma is mentioned later. You know when you get married, brothers and sisters, there is a lot of, especially in the beginning, there's a lot of passion. It's very easy to be affectionate because you're getting something from your spouse. There's, there's a give and take. But when you get older, and I've seen this, I've seen this a lot, when spouses grow old together, in many cases, one of them is no longer able to serve the other. So for example, I mean, I remember just from my own life, my, my grandfather, who passed away many, five years ago, the last six years of his life, he was essentially bed-bound. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't offer anything to my grandmother. He couldn't provide for her. So at that, when, when you reach these later stages, the relationship is a relationship of rahma. You have to have mercy on each other. You might not you, you might not be getting what you used to get from your partner. It's a time where you have to show mercy. And and we usually speak about mercy, you know, the Prophet speaks about having mercy towards children. Because with children in many cases they're just taking, taking. They don't really give you anything. They're vulnerable, so you show them mercy. When you get married, there will come a time where your spouse is going to be very vulnerable. Maybe because of physical sickness, emotional sickness, things will happen. So you cannot, you cannot be an opportunist 
where you only stick in the relationship if there's something in it for you. There needs to be the element of rahma, to have mercy. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking us to be a rahma. You know, Rasulullah was rahmatan lil alameen. He was a mercy to the world. Allah is not asking you to be a rahmatan lil alameen. At, at the very least, be a rahma for your spouse. At the very least. If you can't be a rahmatan lil alameen, at least be a rahma for your wife. Be a rahma for your husband. Mawaddatan wa rahma. This affection. And mawadda, it's that, that love that is manifested through action. In Islam, love is not a noun, it's a verb. It has to be demonstrated. It has to be shown. Through, because it, saying I love you is easy. Mawadda is, is showing that love through sacrifice, day in and day out. It's, it's translating that love into action. And again, going back to the sarahna, mawadda and rahma, no matter how much affection there is between husband and wife, you're going to end up getting into arguments. You're going to fight with each other. You're going to get on each other's nerves. The marriage will only survive if you have the spirit of rahmah. Think to yourself that the more I forgive my spouse, the more Allah will be forgiving towards me. This is the attitude that we should have. وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Truly in that are signs for those who reflect. So we'll continue our discussion on the last part of the, the ayah in our next section. In our next session. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدْ فَعَجَمْ If there are any questions or comments, my leg really cramped up today for some reason. It's a small chair. It's a small chair. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's 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 more of the you know those uh, those Arabian style kind of uh, cushion floor cushions. So I'm I'm sitting on that. So I guess I'm not used to it. I used to sit on it when I was in the house, and now I become spoiled here in the. Uh, <laughs> Sitting on couches and chairs. Um, one question, Chief. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, a mankind being created from dust, does the Quran or Hadith mention what other plants or animals are created from? Is it also dust? It seems. It seems that everything, all living things, were created from the earth, whether they're. Uh, whether they're single-celled organisms, whether they're plants, whether they're animals, the origin of, of all living things seems to be a combination of, uh, of water and earth. You know, Allah even says in the Quran that He created all living things from, from water. So there's this the combination of the, the elements of the earth and, uh, and water. Uh, one thing that's interesting about this bit is that even like from the scientific perspective, every atom or molecule that makes up our body used to be Earth literally just a few decades ago, just a few decades before our birth. Not, not only that, I would even take it a step further that the, the atoms that make up our body are not just from, from the Earth, they're from, from, the, from the, you know, the stars that we see above. You know, Essentially, everything in the universe, if you go back in time, it comes from one one point. That you know, the, so the origin of everything goes back to the same source. You know, essentially, we're, we're stardust. If you think about it, our atoms come from those uh, that that cosmic debris. Because even the Earth formed from that uh, that stardust, so there's there's something. It, it's very beautiful because we're we're connected to everything, and this is really one of the signs of Allah's oneness. The, I mean, the stuff that makes up our bodies, that makes up the sun, the moon, the stars, it's all essentially the same. It's the same material. 
So that, that also is a reminder that the Creator is, is the same. So there's this unity in creation. The atoms that make up our body came from, you know, uh, those stars that we see from the different parts of the universe. Alhamdulillah. And in verse 19, when it talks about bringing forth the death from the living and the living from the dead, yeah, what exactly does it mean to bring forth the dead from the living? At least in the, in the literal sense, the apparent sense. You know, I, I was I was reflecting on that today, and the the only thing that the scholars have mentioned in their tafsir is that it, it just means that God causes, he, you know, bring, he brings forth the dead from the living when he causes them to die. Now, to me, that doesn't really make sense. So I, I haven't found a very good explanation in the uh, in the commentaries to, to really kind of explain what that means uh, uh, in, just from the apparent meaning. That he brings the dead from the living. Yeah, I, I found that to be very challenging. I, I, I looked at a number of commentaries and they, they just explained that, that part of the verse as that he he causes uh, he causes the living things to die. So I, I think it, I think it, it requires more reflection. Thank you. And in the story of Allah, uh, of the fifty prayers being brought down to five, doesn't that imply that either Allah made a mistake in giving the fifty prayers, or Prophet Musa did not? Trust in the wisdom of his Lord, and there's some uh, contradictions going on in there. So, now, of course, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not; he, he's not; he doesn't change his mind. You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does things sometimes to to set other things in motion. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially commanded the uh, the prayers to be 50, of course, he knows what the end result is going to be. But it's also it's also a way of, of revealing his, his mercy and his grace. Also revealing the high station of the Prophet. That, you know, when I command something, he doesn't, he doesn't object. So the the end result was always going to be the five uh, the five daily prayers, but Allah allows this this process to play out. You know, it's kind of like saying that. You know, why did not Allah Subhanahu wa Taala just create the human being in, as an adult? I mean, that, that's that's what the end result is going to be. But He allows things to go through their their natural evolution. So that applies to creation and even sometimes the the divine commandments. That that it, it it reveals God's mercy. It reveals the the stations of. I mean, another example is when Allah Azza wa Jal legislated that, and we spoke about this in Surah at when He legislated uh, the charity that if you want to speak to the Prophet privately, you have to pay charity. That was the law. Now Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So that, that law was abrogated, it was nullified. Now is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was experimenting and he wanted to see who was going to... Allah knew that this was only going to be a temporary, a temporary law. And this temporary law exposed something that was hidden in people's hearts. Number one, that they're stingy, that they're not willing to pay sadaqah to gain prophetic knowledge, meaning that they value money more than they value prophetic knowledge. And it was also an opportunity to see what? To elevate Ali ibn Abi Talib, to, to differentiate Ali ibn Abi Talib from others, that while you don't even want to play, pay a few dirhams to meet with the Prophet, that this Ali, no matter what the price tag is, he'll pay because he values this prophetic knowledge. So the same thing applies with the, the story of, uh, of Mi'raj. 
that Allah legislates things sometimes to expose what is hidden in the hearts, to reveal his uh, certain aspects of his mercy. That when you know that it was originally the original command was fifty prayers a day, and it was reduced to five out of Allah's mercy for us. It, it, you feel even more guilty for not praying those, offering those daily prayers, because you knew that so many concessions were made to accommodate us, to accommodate our weakness and our inability. So, so it's it's basically a process of revealing Allah's mercy and and a way of really highlighting the merits and the high spiritual status of the Prophet. Um, yeah, so this hadith is is mentioned in Wasa'il al-Shia and it's uh, it's mentioned under the uh, the second section. So it's basically uh, on the so depending on the the print that you have, it's the volume on uh, prayer kitab al-salah. And it's the second section under Bab Wujub Salawat al Khams, Wa'adami Wujubi Salat and Sadis, if you could leave. So this section, the obligation of the five daily prayers and and that there are there are there are not six uh, obl obligatory prayers in a single day. So it's under the second section uh, in Kitab al Salah and Wasa al Shia. Uh, that um, Imam Ali Salam says, in the Mashiach, our Shias are those who are the companion of the Christian Prophet uh, every day. Does this have relationship to the thing that that is not subhanahu wa So, so, this is so. No, those are two separate. Those are two separate things. So the 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 five daily prayers, because the Quran says that man jaa whoever does good, they will be given tenfold of it at minimum. That means that when we perform the five daily prayers, the reward is multiplied by ten, which gives us the reward of what was initially legislated. Now, when Ahlul Bayt say that, you know, you know, for example, one of the uh, one of the, the signs of Iman is fifty-one rak'ah. This is a reference to the obligatory prayers, which are seventeen rak'ah, and you add the thirty-four recommended, the the nawafil. Uh, so that that's so that's going above and beyond uh, what has been made obligatory. So and that's performing the you know the nafilat uh, al-fajr, al-dhuhr, asr, maghrib, isha. So that's to go above and beyond. So the fifty-one uh, rak'ah doesn't it's, it doesn't apply to uh, the tradition that I read about uh, the five daily prayers having the reward of 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 someone who did fifty prayers. Those are two separate things. And. Uh, how does the four different times for prayers, how does that compare to the three times a day that we see us tend to pray the five prayers? So, so there's, there, there's no contradiction between the two because even those, uh, those three timings, and let me pull up the verse. So, أَقَمِ الصَّلَاءَ لِدُلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَسَقِ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنِ الْفَجْرِ so those are those are three times, you know. Uh, so there's Fajr, Ghasab al Layl, and Duluk al Shams. Duluk al Shams is when the sun is is uh, is directly overhead. So it implies Dhuhr uh, and Asr, Fajr, and then Ghasab uh, al Layl. So it depends on how you articulate it. So there are four times mentioned here, but one of the times includes two. When the Quran speaks about the three times in, in another verse, Fajr of course stands alone, and those other two times 
they indicate two separate prayers. So Ghassat al Layl is, uh, is uh, Maghrib al Asha, and uh, Duluk al Shams is, uh, is Duha al Asr. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. And um, really, one question related to uh, last week's class. Sure. Uh, verse 11, where it says, Allah originates creation, then re reproduces it, and returns it back to Him. Um, the part about returning back to Him, does that imply that even people who are in heaven and hell will, especially people who are in hell, will also slowly, gradually return back to Allah and become closer to the Lord at the end? Or is this uh, so? So, so that, that is one understanding of the verse that the majority of people, even, even, even people who end up in hellfire, you know, because Jahannam is essentially a place, and I, I've given this example many times, it's, it's, it's essentially a spiritual hospital. It's a place of, of purification. Most people, most people, will receive that purification. And they will, able to, they, they will be able to remove those pollutants and those contaminants from the heart. And they will be taken out. But if, if those vices, if the heart is so dark and so corrupt that it's... That, and, and the soul refuses to acknowledge its wrongdoing, and if it refuses to change, then of course it's going to abide there forever. So it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just arbitrarily keeps certain people in hell forever. It's because there is a refusal to change. Now you may think that how is it possible that someone is in Jahannam and they don't change? Now there's a difference in, in changing because of, of punishment, but there has to be genuine change at the level of the soul. So the majority of people will will return to him, meaning that they will enjoy a certain degree of divine proximity because they will they will be taken out of hell. Now there would there will be a handful of people who will remain in uh, in hell forever because the the souls just uh, resist uh, they resist any effort to uh, to change and and some some hearts require you know more rehabilitation than others. You know in the same way that. You know, when if, if you guys ever seen certain driveways, you know, sometimes the driveway is dirty and you can kind of just wash it. But but sometimes the dirt is so deeply rooted in the cement that you need to power wash it. It, it has to be exposed to high pressure. You know, there are certain types of contaminants that can only be removed through intense heat. So it depends on on the spiritual disease that we're talking about. But when you go back to the verse, Allah khalq, thumma yu'idu, that God originates creation, then He brings it back, and people will return, they'll come back to life. And then after some time, people will return to God. They will return to that place of proximity. Now, the believers, of course, that will happen, you know, quite uh, quickly. For others, it might uh, it might take a long time. Some of them might even have to undergo, they might have to endure the punishment of hellfire, but most people eventually will will be taken out, and some will remain. But because most will be taken out, it seems that the the verse, you know, when, when the majority of, of, of cases are a certain way, you can speak of it in, in an absolute. From the ilayhi turjaw, and to him you shall return. Thank you very much, Shane. Jazakumullah. So we will uh, we will continue our discussion uh, next week. I was hoping to get a little bit further, but uh, but uh, inshallah, we'll try to move a little bit more quickly in our next uh, session. Inshallah. Jazakumullah. Please, please keep me. Especially these times, and pray for all of us and pray for the entire community. Inshallah. Please. Humanity. Inshallah. Keep us Allah in the dark. Longer life to take you, bless you, inshallah, shower his blessings on the family. 
may we do more and more work for the propagation of Islam, for the spread of Islam, inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah bless you. I I always appreciate your dawah. May Allah bless you for always remembering me. And uh, I pray for all of you, inshallah. Let, let us increase our duas for the Imam of our time. You know, I think the world is, is starting to realize how how vulnerable we are, how all of these governments have, have failed. I I think that we are we're moving in a direction where people are starting to lose faith in a lot of these governments and institutions and we pray that we're moving closer to the time of the Zuhur. we pray for the safety of our imam and we pray that allah gives us the tawfiq to witness the the establishment of his government just like we spoke about today imam al kabul says that that verse that he revives the earth after its its death i think we've we've seen in many cases the 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 death of the earth the failure of of governments and institutions, the, the widespread corruption, and we pray that Allah hastens the, the reappearance of the Imam, and through his justice, you know, we will see the revival of the, the human spirit and the prosperity of, of people around the world. Okay, brothers and sisters, we'll see you next week, inshallah.